platforms are systems for interconnecting, layering, and scaffolding technologies, which use standards to ensure interoperability between diverse devices, services, and human interactions. The significance of platforms is that they are designed as sites where future actions can emerge without being determined in advance by the platform's design. While the constraints platforms impose may be strict to allow for interoperability between nodes, interactions between these nodes can remain undetermined by design. While the emergence of platforms is typically dated back to the birth of computer networking and often thought of as a strictly digital technology, here we take a more comprehensive view of platforms. Beginning with the Trans-Siberian Railway as a first example, we follow Stephanie Sherman's account of railways as conduits between people, places, and production, acknowledging how platforms entangle the social and the technical. This challenges the notion of technology as a one-stop solution to social problems, or otherwise steerable by social forces, as if worker-owned or democratically managed platforms can bring about ethical consequences. Instead, as the emergence of computing platforms in the Soviet Union shows us, Platforms cannot simply be steered by an organization's intentions. Rather, they pressure governments into particular courses of action, never simply conforming to their rule. Platforms nonetheless remain significant for governments because they allow for rules and standards to scale without depending on a centralized authority to constantly enforce them, what Alexander Galloway calls protocological control. Looking to the emergence of computing in China, as well as its more contemporary incarnations, we can see how this paradigm of control is taken up by states as an opportunity to rebrand themselves. Rather than attempting to make platforms in their image, state power learns to follow the logic of platforms and remake itself in its image. A traditional idea of platforms, as subject to the interests of government or human actors, stems from an imaginary of platforms as discrete control points that can be used to purposefully organize social interactions. This imaginary of the platform as a control panel obscures the ways that platforms intervene in the world, create new social relationships within it, and act back on the intentions of their designers, a dynamic we call platform poesis. By adopting platform poesis as an analytic framework, we can challenge the idea that a single state power or information control panel can solve wicked problems like climate change. If this were the case, legal or technological solutions to climate change produced by the strongest governments would be the most effective ones. But without attending to platform poesis and the complexity of the relations it generates, power does not translate to effective platforms. By attending to historical examples, taking a journey in time and space from the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union and today's China, we see how platforms deployed to reinforce imaginaries of powerful states ultimately confounded these imaginaries by operating according to their own rules and conditions. The Trans-Siberian Railroad is an infrastructure platform that was designed with the goal of strengthening a centralized vision of the Russian Empire. But the reality of platform poesis shattered the imaginary over time. The project was conceived in the context of the Russian Empire suffering a humiliating defeat in Crimea. A lack of infrastructure and maintenance allowing Russia to transport troops quickly was a key factor in the defeat. At the same time, Russia was expanding its empire to the east. Inspired by the Trans-Canadian Railroad, Russia's Sergei Vita saw the Trans-Siberian Railroad as a project that consolidated the state through economic gains from Siberia's natural resources and the promise of homogenizing colonized regions. However, the railroad suffered from Russia's lack of capacity in managing the railroad. The project, while initially succeeding in producing state imaginaries, proved to be five times more expensive than planned, and parts of the railroad were more fragile than planned or missing altogether. At the same time, Meiji Japan was emerging as an imperial power in the east in the aftermath of its victory in the Sino-Japanese War. After the victory, a majority of Japanese citizens held militaristic attitudes, exacerbated by the three power intervention by Russia, Germany, and France. However, both the Japanese public, as well as the Meiji and Ito cabinet saw Russia to be less of a threat than other European powers. And yet, an anti-Russian stance was pushed by the Taikodoshikai Association that argued against the paralysis of the nation in the face of the threat from Russia. So, the Taikodoshikai perceived the Trans-Siberian Railroad as a move towards offense from Russia and advocated for war. The Russian government did not plan for the serious military threat from Japan, dismissing Asian people in racially charged terms and only seeing the Trans-Siberian Railroad as a peaceful endeavor, 
not accounting for effects of interactions between the platform and geopolitical agents who interact with it. So, when Japan attacked, the Russian military made several strategic mistakes, relying on the Trans-Siberian Railroad and the indigenous Siberian population to supplement troops to the region. Both turned out to be problematic, as the railroad didn't have strong enough infrastructure to transport the military, contributing to Russia's loss in the war and the weakening of its state power. The reception of this loss, as complicated by Japan's own imperial project as it was, had a major impact on state imaginaries near and far, as anti-Western imperial state ideas surfaced in the Ottoman Empire, India, and Egypt liberation movements. As the Trans-Siberian Railroad was being modernized, following the rise of the Soviet Union, new, smaller platforms were being developed to improve the military and scientific capabilities of the USSR, computers. Often the origins of Soviet computing are told through the narrative of a Cold War dichotomy, where Soviet ideology resisted computing innovations already underway in the West. But the skepticism of Soviet engineers and philosophers wasn't purely ideological. It reflected an anxiety about platform poesis, and namely, the capacity of computing platforms to undermine the centralized state's authority. While Soviet computers at the time had large mainframe architectures that were readily controllable by centralized authorities and suited to military applications, more decentralized, personal microcomputers championed in the West threatened to disbalance the centralized structure of Soviet governance. Thus, the Soviet Union strictly regulated the production of computing platforms. While Hungary would be tasked with software development, East Germany would provide disk storage devices and copper oxide diodes, while the new Russian city of Zelenograd would begin to produce microprocessors domestically. Meanwhile, Soviet censorship of decentralized software production, so crucial to the rise of US hacker culture and Silicon Valley experimentation, prevented the Soviets from developing an organic competency in software development. Engineers had to depend instead on reverse engineering Western designs. Everywhere, the Soviet state was fighting against contamination by platform poesis, but to detrimental effects. While it desperately needed the improvements to productivity afforded by Western platforms, it could not implement these platforms without destabilizing its existing socioeconomic order. Perhaps then, the reality of computation revealed by platform poesis is what motivated Khrushchev to call for openness to Western computing platforms during his period of reforms. Instead of forcing the design of computing platforms to fit the mold of the state, platform poesis, or the technical laws underlying computing systems and the possibilities for social organization that they reveal, will be prioritized over the production of a closed state regime. Thus, computing platforms will become symbols of Soviet power in their own right, rather than operating in the service of an existing state imaginary while the Mir computer would become a symbol of international computing as the first Soviet computer purchased by the American IBM. Computers in Estonia came to be called RAL after importing the Soviet model Ural-1. Meanwhile, an inverted imaginary of Soviet platforms was emerging in China. Through the first five-year plan of the 1950s, industrialization in China took on a distinctly Soviet character as Soviet engineers and management techniques were introduced in great volumes to revolutionize Chinese production capacities. This dependency reached its peak with the 12-year plan of 1956, which saw the Soviet-backed development of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, as well as the first Chinese computers, the models 102 and 103, both derived from Soviet platforms. But these developments came to a standstill as Sino-Soviet relations deteriorated through the late 1950s. No longer able to depend on Soviet platforms and industry, China would adopt a principle of self-reliance, which would bear a characteristic mark on Chinese computing until the end of the century. Like the Third Front program of 1964, to shelter Chinese production capacities in the heart of its mainland, Chinese computing also moved inward, arduously developing the productive capacity to produce transistors and integrated circuits domestically. This constrained development environment created unique incentives for platform development, they resulted in the Model 107 in 1958, the first indigenous Chinese computer, spearheaded by the efforts of China's mother of computing, Jia Pei Su. Chinese engineers had thus reverse engineered the laws underlying computing systems and organized their own production lines to implement them. But reproducing platform poesis from scratch could not keep up with the speed of its development elsewhere in the world. Chinese computing capacities lagged behind. 
This changed following the open door policy of 1976, which opens up economic and intellectual exchanges with other countries outside of China. In fits and starts, Chinese engineering began to follow the currents of platform poesis, rather than attempting to reproduce them in a closed environment. Thus systems like the Sinotype series emerged, designed to support Chinese ideograms on Western computing platforms. As popular computing platforms became compatible with the world's most spoken language, China would soon be able to make itself an image of platforms that pushed beyond its linguistic and geopolitical boundaries, rather than producing platforms within these lines. Platform poesis with Chinese characteristics was born. Learning from these cases together, we can grasp the nature of platform poesis and use it as a lens to understand the impact of today's large-scale platforms, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, China's expansive infrastructure development projects. The Digital Silk Road is a key component of the BRI that allows China to participate in building digital networks, enabling the implementation of large-scale projects such as the Big Earth Data Platform, which aims to distribute Earth observation technologies and information services globally to configure interventions for mitigating environmental risks. The Big Earth is a platform in a more contemporary sense, as it allows integrating massive amounts of disjointed data and users. It also has the unique affordance of supporting infrastructure development based on its findings, thereby reproducing the life cycle of the platform recursively. The Big Earth contributes to the BRI's political imaginaries of China's commitment to fostering an amicable, secure, and prosperous neighborhood. The initiative has been branded as green, healthy, intelligent, and peaceful, underlying China's commitment to the environment. Through these projects, China expands its power abroad by promoting imaginaries of its strength and benevolence. These imaginaries are solidified by the aesthetics of the Big Earth platform, which advertises a unified Earth control panel for real-time management of environmental crises. At the same time, while the Big Earth is positioned as China's decision support system, it suffers from an entrenched dependency on data collection and analysis practices mediated by the politics of participating states. Overstepping the necessity of political accountability and public involvement in environmental governance, the project reifies the monolithic statue of state control. For the Big Earth, a lack of accountability and distributed decision-making mechanisms is a systemic problem because participating states are replete with the baggage of authoritarian politics. The systematic corruption is particularly insidious to the data collection and decision-making techniques the system aims to support. These entry points of flawed data comprise the outcomes of platform poesis. The success of the BRI, as of yet, is uncertain. Zooming to the scale of the Big Earth demonstrates how platform poesis influences even the massive resources of the Chinese authoritarian state. The imaginaries the state is trying to instill are contingent on the dynamic of a multitude of entry points and relations generated by platforms. But a future stage of platform development might overcome the geopolitical hurdles of platform poesis altogether. For this to happen, the imaginary of a platform as a control panel would need to be superseded by another model that accounts for the distributed, dynamical properties of platform poesis. Such considerations would not be entirely new. The science of cybernetics, once feared by the Soviets, also grappled with how to understand the coherent behaviors of complex systems. A critical part of this thinking involved a concern with reflexivity, or the ability of a system to take account of its own behavior, and thereby to make sense of complexity and transform it into directed behaviors. In the 1980s, the Chilean biologists Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela, observing this reflexity in biological systems, proposed that it enabled them to self-reproduce and endure in time. They called this autopoiesis. If platforms follow an internal logic by which they extend their influence on the world, what we have called platform poesis, then what would it mean for a platform to be autopoetic? What would it mean for a platform to take account of its own behavior, act back on itself, and create a more coordinated intervention in the world? The theory of autopoiesis involves several principles that we might consider in relation to large-scale platforms that have significant geopolitical effects. An autopoietic system takes into consideration external stressors and is able to overcome them. Typically, the indeterminate effects of platform poesis are constrained from the outside, like China's early computers delimited by its principle of self-reliance. What approaches to sensing and analysis would enable the platform to achieve transistasis, 
the tendency to change itself according to circumstances, without depending on an external geopolitical environment to maintain its efficacy? Would this transistasis require that a platform accounts for diplomatic forces external to it, even regulating them? An autopoietic system always involves boundaries that differentiate it from the outside world so that it can maintain internal consistency and resist the process of entropy by which order transforms into disorder. For traditional platforms, like the Trans-Siberian Railroad, these boundaries where the platform becomes self-regulated are ill-defined, their ambiguity masked instead by the catch-all of a coherent state power. After all, would it even be in the interest of such a state power for a platform to determine its own boundaries? Would this motivate the state to redefine its contours? And what political forms of self-organization, alternatives to the nation-state, might platform autopoiesis motivate? Control is central to autopoietic systems, as a productive means to manage external stressors. Platforms are often subjected to the control of the state for the purpose of advancing political goals. But what would take place if platforms established control from within? Would this autopoietic control create tensions with state interests, like decentralized computing with the Soviet Union? Or would it be more easily subjected to it, staving off the effects of platform poesis? These considerations raise a central concern. If platform autopoiesis is deployed for political or economic ends, would this undermine its very autopoietic properties? Is autopoiesis in tension with political intentionality? or could it crystallize alternative political formations and autonomies? If platform poesis brings into existence uncaptured political realities, does platform autopoiesis capture them, or does it help them to survive?